take your hymn books tonight, page number 89 in your hymn books. Page number 89, let's head over, sing I'm Satisfied with Just a Cottage Below. Most of them in Canyon Country. Page number 89, Mansion Over the Hilltop. That's just for you, Vicki, that was just for you there. Page number 89. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold, but in that city Why don't you lift it up? Amen. Take your Bible, uh, take your hymn books if you would, for page 46. Page 46, when I see the blood, let's sing the first and the fourth verse. Page number 46, Christ our Redeemer died on the cross. Page number 46. Here we go. Christ our Redeemer died on the cross, died for the sinner.
the blood. I will pass, I will pass over you. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Thank you so much for singing so well. I wonder if one of the deacons could grab a microphone, please, as we get around here to the congregation. Good to have you here this evening. Thank you very much for coming back tonight. And yes, of course, this does begin our study on the book of Revelation. It'll take us probably to the next leap year. We'll get done with it at some point. But uh, tonight we'll maybe get into chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, but there'll be a lot of introductory stuff tonight. But I just want to give you a few things. Got a lot of things to get ahead of here before we actually get into the study. Uh, just keep in mind, next Saturday, for those of you ladies and even some of you gentlemen that are into this kind of thing, uh, we're going to have a shepherd shop, which is a fall Christmas boutique kind of a thing. Uh, it'll be here down in the uh, uh, parking lot area below me, behind me here, uh, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. next Saturday. There's a big uh, banner out there to remind you if you're driving up and down the street. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in maybe uh, having a little area to sell your wares, you could talk to Sister Vicki. Sister Vicki, would you raise your hand real quick there? And just talk to her right after the services, and she'll get you that information. Uh, November 22nd is our Thankful Heart Sunday. Uh, we'll have, well, hopefully we'll all come to church that morning with a thankful heart. Amen. And then uh, though we'll come back Sunday evening. We might have, depending on if Summer can get this all taken care of, we might have a blood drive between services for those who'd like to donate blood. And then at 5 p.m., we'll come back and, and, and observe the Lord's table here uh, as we take communion at 5 p.m. Uh, November 25th, there'll be no midweek service for those of you that might be traveling or whatever the case might be for family. Uh, of course, the governor says you can't go anywhere. <laughs> but anyway, I say go somewhere just to irritate them. But anyway, there'll be no midweek service. Uh, that week, so go ahead and enjoy your time, or if you're doing your dinner early or preparing early, it gives you a little time there. And then November 28th, we'll gather back here the Saturday right after Thanksgiving. For those of you that can, hopefully we get a good group of you out. Our saturation Saturday at 10.30 a.m. We'll also have out, hand out some uh, of our Christmas uh, Eve uh, service invitations as well. Uh, December 24th, if you're looking way ahead, is our Christmas Eve candlelight service at 6.30 p.m., uh, we will have a regular Christmas service the Sunday prior, but that will be our Christmas Eve candlelight service on Christmas Eve so for those of you that can make it. Again, invite a friend. The gospel will be preached. And then, of course, tonight uh, we begin the book of Revelation. As those of you are thinking of some praises tonight, I do have submissions letter. All right. Uh, we, we support a, a good group of missionaries here at our church, and we have for several years, and we're glad that we're able to still do that. Uh, I'd like to just highlight a couple, uh, three missionaries tonight. Uh, missionary Gary Max to New Zealand. Uh, he's actually in, um, um, what is the name of that place here? Well, he's in New Zealand. How about that? Uh, it says, we trust our Lord is blessing you. You are loved by the Maxes and the Master. We rejoice in his saving grace. Speaking of his sweet grace and glorious salvation, Rob, who was somebody who had visited their church prior, Visited our worship service just five weeks ago. When I first met him, he wouldn't even look up and engage me with his eyes during the service. He just looked down. His sentences consisted of one-word answers. He was a broken man, both spiritually and emotionally, but my Jesus changed all that. Last Thursday, I had the great privilege of sharing Christ with him, and now he has forever been changed by the Savior. Rob is now singing, smiling, and even having real conversations. Uh, this past Wednesday night in our Bible study, he, uh, he took it upon himself to pass out our songbooks. This week, I'm meeting with him again to have a study about baptism. Pray for Rob and his newfound faith and relationship with his Lord. This past Sunday, I met a young man, 25-year-old. He now calls himself simply John. He is of Chinese birth. He has traveled through a number of countries and now in New Zealand. He said he has no family that he knows of. He is studying at university. He told me, I'm searching for the meaning of life. I am all alone. I have no friends, and I don't even know how to make friends. I told him that he was now among friends and that the greatest friend he would ever have is Jesus Christ. He said he would come back, pray for John. And that is uh, the New Zealand missions there uh, with, uh, let's see here, um, a landmark Baptist church in Queensland. There we go. All right. Now we have the... For God's so loving the Chinese, the Watsons. All right, you know the, the Watsons. We've been supporting the Watsons for several years now, Dan and Debbie Watson. 
They originally were in China, but because of Debbie's health, and of course, parents had passed away while they were on the field, which is a, always a, a horrible thing, but nevertheless, because of her health, primarily they had to come back to the States, and they are up in the uh, uh, Canada area uh, serving the Lord, uh, ministering to the Chinese people, and there's a, a huge group of Chinese up there. Uh, anyway, a couple of things here. It says God's provision. We are uh, amazed and very thankful how God has provided our needs. Gas cards to get us where we need to go, uh, sacked groceries, missions, apartments, stock to boot, unexpected love gifts just when bills were due. Thank you to God's special ravens. Must have been reading, must have been reading his Bible. Uh, health, uh, Dan, the husband, Dan Watson, developed a severe ear infection while we are in Northern California. They're down here, by the way. Uh, getting a little bit more money for deputation. He is still applying antibiotic solution prescribed by the VA doctor and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of a car fund, uh, our 2003 Toyota Highlander has been such a blessing and has fit our family and ministry needs so well. However, its high mileage and increasing repair needs necessitate that we look toward replacing it. To date, God has provided 4,000 towards this replacement. We are praising God. Uh, Toyota Highlander, I wonder how many miles that thing on it. I had 515,000 on my Corolla, but anyway. And then prayer, uh, our hearts are in Canada with the Chinese. We desire to return as soon as possible, but we have two challenges to overcome to return. Number one, the USA-Canadian border is closed to non-essential crossing until October 30, 21st, which was uh, a couple weeks back, when both governments will review the issue to determine whether the border will be reopened or whether the closure will be extended another month. Note, we consider God's work essential. And then number two, we, raise, we, we must raise the necessary additional support for higher rent and fuel costs to commute across the border, and particularly for Debbie's health insurance. And so it says, thank you very much for your faithful prayers and financial support. May the Lord return you double fold. And of course, it has a little note here mentioning that they received our money. So we praise the Lord for that. And then uh, one more here from Jim and Ari Herzl, who have been ministering in, on the island of Vanuatu for a great many years. Um, it just simply says here, furlough 2020. If you remember, they were with us uh, four or five months back. Uh, furlough 2020, the last of our meetings is coming up quickly. Tickets have, Lord willing, been confirmed and locked in. We have vouchers for the managed isolation and quarantine in New Zealand, and we'll be continuing the process of getting permission to return to Vanuatu. By the way, when they go to New Zealand, they have to stay there for 14 days, and then they get uh, to go to Vanuatu. Exciting times. We also continue to keep each of you in our partnering churches and families in prayer. And uh, let's see here, in terms of some prayer requests, um, prayer, uh, excuse me, praise, school and youth ministries for our young people have continued without issue. We praise God for this change to reach them for Christ and to touch the lives of their families through their outreach and testimonies. We are thankful that God has continued his work in Vanuatu while we have been stateside and people have been saved, baptized, and added to the church since we have been here. We thank you very much for your prayer and for your giving of faithfulness. So we thank God for the Vanuatu folks, amen, and for folks getting saved. So there are three of our missionaries that we have supported for a great many years, and um, I praise the Lord that God is continuing to bless them. All right, well, who's got a mic? All right, Ryan's got a mic. Ryan, why don't you start off by just giving your praise about how you enjoyed Florida and how the weather was. Don't you got to turn that on? Is it? Oh, is it? Oh, that's the Arturo side now, right? And Jerry's side? I think we should blame it on the bossa nova. Edie Gourmet, it's pre-80. You don't know it. You don't know it. Yeah, you don't know it. All right. Uh, well, I'm glad you're back. And Reagan, did you enjoy your birthday trip that was 3,000 miles away from California? Did you... In did you're just like this person that from New Zealand that doesn't speak anything. All right, you need to get saved. Um, so, Reagan, uh, what was your favorite ride at Disney World? I didn't do it. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, okay, there we go. Um, I liked Splash Mountain and the Haunted Mansion, I guess. I thought those things were here in Southern California. Oh, they're, I'm sorry, it's closed. Very different. Well, it's free. Um, Disney World doesn't have Indiana Jones. Oh, darn. Man. Do they have a Walt going like this at the beginning? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right. It's good. All right. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed yourself. How old are you now, Reagan? Twelve. 
one more year and you officially have to die. All right, anyway, I'm <laughs> just kidding. That's what your dad told me when we were on the mountain. All right, uh, who's got a, uh, who's got a prayer? Who's got a praise tonight? Oh, let's go to summer. All right. Uh, I just uh, praise the Lord that our president isn't backing down. And Amen. is stepping up to, <gasps> to fight back. We've got the Trump team here tonight. <laughs> and um, I just praise, I, I, I keep praying that the Lord's going to reveal his truth to, to this country. I'm with you. And I just know one thing. There's some guy with a white truck with a big Trump flag on the back of it. I don't even know who it is. No, I know who it is. I know who it is. He won't let me drive his truck. All right. Um, who else got a quick praise tonight? Let's go over here to Vicky, and then we're going to go to Rob, because Rob has a big praise. Joy, I'm not too certain about, but, uh, but anyway. Vicky. Okay, so um, we've been, I've been asking for prayer for my mom, and you know she had to have a, a blood transfusion uh, probably about a month ago now, and... She was at like seven, and with two units, she should only be her hemoglobin back up to nine, but she's actually up to over 11. Wow. And Amen. so something's kick-starting in her body that's, that's doing a good thing. So Amen. that's just, you know, that's a huge answer to prayer. So thank you, everybody. You can't keep a good Dutch woman down. There's no doubt about that. Rob, what do you got for me? Hello. I'm for fortunate to be standing here today Yesterday, driving on the freeway, I got clipped by someone behind me. My truck went around twice, it hit the side of the mountain, went upside down. I came back on my tires and opened the door and I walked out. <laughs> I could have landed on the, on the hood and been crushed, but I, was, I got a little, little sore spot on my arm, but I survived and I thank God it wasn't ready for me. I guess it, wasn't, it just wasn't my time, I think. And I'm a believer for sure. Amen. What? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I had a witness. Yes. <laughs> West, westbound. Uh, he, 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 was wed he was heading east, but he ended up eastbound. So anyway. <laughs> we have a new favorite ride at Disney World. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, the Rob ride. Yeah. Uh, by the way, that pain in your arm was Joy going, what is wrong with you? Did you have your seatbelt on, Rob? Yeah. Did you? If, I, you know, if that was me, I'd be on the hood. I can just hear people saying, this is why you don't have a head. Because I don't have my seatbelt on. All right. Let's move on. Who else got a quick praise tonight? Praise, praise, praise. Uh, Tim LeMaster is kind of sheepishly putting his hand up there. He's not, he's not sure. Remember the commercial? Uh, I just want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Mays for coming here today. Pray, uh, pray for him because he's going to be going back east to visit his family. And uh, it, we, we all need prayer like that. But uh, and I'm grateful for all the choir members who sang today. It was wonderful. It was just beautiful. So yeah. thank you. I enjoyed the choir number. I didn't understand it, but it was a good choir number. You have to learn you know, some Latin or something. Yeah, it was mercy. I got it. We're good. Have mercy. Amen. Who else got another quick praise? Why don't we give it to Jonathan Cox because he's officially the uh, the scorekeeper for what's going on with the campaign right now. Not quite, but what do you mean? You've been sitting in front of that computer since Tuesday night. Go ahead. Well, anyway, um, yesterday Whoa. I wrote a letter to the president, and I pretty much told him that I stand behind you now, just as I did four years ago, and I will not back down from the Democrats trying to steal this from you. And when I wrote in his letter at the end, I wrote Ephesians chapter four, 6, four, verses 14 through 18, about putting, putting on the full armor of God. And that is what we should do if we're going to support him. And let's not back down from this fight because he is going to win this. Truth and justice always prevail. Trump 2020. Oh, man. Man. That's the Korean Charlie Kirk right there. That's good. Amen. By the way, um, just as a side note here, it is interesting that they still haven't called North Carolina. They still haven't called Alaska, which is like a no-brainer. Like, when's, who's the last guy that won that? Martin Fieldman? I mean, uh, was that a president? Yeah, Martin Van Buren. There it is right there. I, I messed that one up. You know me, pre-1950. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I don't know why they did that. I think they've done that to, to uh, condition the 214 number that you keep seeing and the inevitability of the other side getting over. So just know that there's always 
always a reason for why they do what they do. So, all right, who else has got another quick praise tonight? Let's go back to Summer, who just wants to say something. A question. Oh, I, I mentioned this this morning. I know you were picking up your wonderful family. Um, Mike is up about 500-something right now. By Tuesday, he should be up well over 1,000. And, and, and I don't think they would have had the thank you rally yesterday or volunteer thing if, if Mike wasn't going to win. I mean, they could have, but it wouldn't have been such a, a big deal. And, and Scott Wilk is ahead, and, and of course, Peter won. You know that. So, all right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anybody else got another quick praise before we indulge tonight? All right. Well, amen. I'm going to ask if uh, Jerry can get my notes to me over here because that would be really helpful wherever he is. Is my son over there? All right. That's good. All right. Go ahead and uh, take your Bibles. Go to the book of Revelation if you would tonight. I'm going to go ahead and have a word of prayer and we'll ask God to, to bless our time and that this might be a profitable and encouraging study. And Jerry, I'll need the first page of this. Isn't that good? All right, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to meet. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to assemble. And Father, we pray that you would bless our time together. May it be beneficial. May we walk out with an, a greater understanding of the book of Revelation. Father, it's going to take some time. And Father, I pray that you'll bless in Jesus Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Uh, if you do require notes, I will make all my notes available. I will have some, um, uh, some things that will be up on the screen tonight and um, over the course of this study the next several weeks. So uh, it will be a little more interactive for you, especially when we get to the timelines and things of that nature. It might be better if you could see that. Uh, but um, what I want to do is basically give you a fresh perspective on the book of Revelation. Uh, I have taught through it already two times, uh, but I still think uh, no matter how many times you go through a particular book of the Bible or no matter how many times you read your Bible all the way through, God the Holy Spirit always reveals something new, something fresh. Not to suggest that it's new truth, it's just your, your brain is too dense and you, you don't catch it the first time or the second or the third time through. Or um, you weren't that deep in his word and the spirit of God just didn't illuminate you at that moment. So as I get older in the Lord and, and, and increase my walk with him, uh, God will, will show me some things and will show you some things that are in that Bible that are, have been there for centuries that, that have just been waiting for someone to see them. And uh, there'll, there'll be a few of those things over the course of this study. Not tonight, but there'll be a few of those things. Uh, but uh, what I, my desire tonight is really just to kind of uh, get you really um, on par with what we're attempting to do here. I'm going to switch the mic, brother. And just kind of desire to keep you here, not all night, but of course throughout this study, so it can be a benefit to you. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1, gives us the entire focus of this book. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel and unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Before I get into my notes, let me just from my heart say a few things very briefly. The book of Revelation is not a very complicated book. Uh, it is simply a book that just needs to be believed as it is written, in the manner that it is written. And I will go through manner of interpretation and things of that nature over the course of this tonight. But it's not a closed book. Now what's interesting is in the book of Daniel, 
Brother Bob, of course, is going through Daniel for our Sunday school every Sunday at 9.15 a.m. I would really encourage you, for those of you who come to Sunday school, to be faithful to that. And for those of you who may not be faithful to it, try to be faithful because that Daniel study will be uh, paramount as you look through the book of Revelation because both of those books should be read in tandem. So we're going to be referencing the book of Revelation and, of course, the book of Daniel, of course, all through the Word of God. Let me also say this about the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation assures us that all the junk that we have seen will get rectified. Uh, and I'm not talking about just the last week. I'm talking like 6,000 years of human history. Everything is going to get a comeuppance, a reckoning. God is going to fix it all. And it's not going to come by way of the UN. We're not going to have legislation of morality in the, in the world. God is going to set up his own kingdom and will rule with a rod of iron for 1,000 years. And then, of course, we'll go off into eternity, chapters 21 and chapters 22. So everything that we see, though we scratch our wooden head and say, I wonder if that guy got away with this, and I wonder if that group got away with that. Listen. If the Bible means what it says about God and says what it means, no one's getting away with anything. And so Jesus Christ will make sure uh, that everybody will have a fair shake. And not only that, uh, if a man is, stands before him without Jesus Christ, he will be sent to the lake of fire. And for those that are saved and born again, they will, of course, spend eternity with him. But there's a few things that I want to just tell you tonight by way of introduction. The first is this, disciplined disciples. Disciplined disciples. This study will require discipline. Discipline to hear what is being taught. Discipline to study what is being taught because I don't want you to just take what I'm saying at face value. I would hope you would go home and do your own study and do what the Bereans did to the Apostle Paul and search the Scripture to make, things, to make sure those things are so. And it's important for you to do that because a preacher who is walking with God and doesn't have an ego doesn't mind if you're searching the Scriptures to make sure that what I'm saying is so. Paul did not look at the Bereans and say, why, you bunch of backstabbers, I already gave you what the Bible said. You didn't have to double check what I said. No, it's good to double check. Amen. It's good to double check. Don't take some preacher either behind this pulpit, on the radio, or whomever you tend to like at face value all the time. Always check the guy. Always check the guy. So discipline to hear what is being taught, discipline to study what is being taught, and discipline to rightly divide the word of truth. That is going to be key because we know 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're going to see some right divisions just in the 22 chapters of the book of Revelation. Of course, there's right division that has to be done in other places, but right in the book of Revelation, you're going to see that you're going to have to rightly divide where things go. Uh, one of the false notions of the book of Revelation, at least in my opinion, is this notion that the book of Revelation gives you a, a consistent narrative of the, of the, of the seven-year tribulation. In other words, a lot of people think that Revelation chapter 6 starts the first year and then you get to chapter 19 and you get to the seventh year. No, that isn't the case. I'm going to show you that it actually jumps around a little bit, okay? And it's important to make those distinctions as you go around. So this study is extensive. It will be expository, meaning we're going to exposit each passage uh, in its entirety. And it's exhaustive. It will require a level of commitment that previous studies might have lacked. For those of you who stuck with us in Ruth, thank you. Praise the Lord. Uh, whether you were able to do it here or online, I hope that study was an enrichment to you. If you are able to maintain this level of discipline, 
I can say with assurance that you will understand more about the book of Revelation after we are done and each Sunday as we go through it than when we began. This level of discipline must also be evident in this preacher. Why? Because I can lose my attention. Yeah, I can. There have been times in the past where I start a study and I'm like, I'm bored. We're going to go somewhere else now. And Job, yeah, yeah. You think I'm going to get through 42 chapters? Come on, anyway. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I do get bored, and, and I really need to discipline myself. So if I'm asking you to be disciplined, I'm going to be disciplined as well. And let me also say that that doesn't mean the Sunday nights will be interrupted. We might have some missionaries, might have special speakers. We may not have a Sunday night service. Uh, this, this good couple here that visited tonight, uh, they came last Sunday, but they didn't realize we didn't have the evening services. So we're, we're glad they didn't hold a grudge, and they're here tonight. So we're, so we're glad they're here. But nevertheless... If I can be disciplined, then hopefully you can be disciplined as well. So discipline disciples as we look to this study. Number two, manner of interpretation. We talked about this Wednesday night. There is only one interpretation, but there's many applications, okay? This is so important. Don't let somebody say, well, that's your interpretation. No, that's the wrong way to put it. There is only one interpretation but there's many applications. That doesn't mean the interpretation changes, it just means you can apply it a little bit differently depending upon context and situation. I'll give you a for instance. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. There's only one way to interpret that. God created everything, amen? It doesn't say Buddha did, it doesn't say Allah did, it doesn't say anything like that. It says that God created the heaven and the earth. There's no other way to get around that. There is one interpretation. As you read through Genesis chapter 1 and you get from verse 3 all the way to the end of the chapter, you start getting into day 1, God did this. Day 2, God did this. Day 3, God did this. Day 7, He rested. There's really no other way to interpret those things. So don't let someone come to you and say in a sly way, well, that's the way the church you attend interpret. No, 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 no. We're going to interpret the Bible as it is intended, as it's laid out. We're not going to try to uh, smoke and mirror, mirror things and try to say, well, I know it says that, but I'm not going to do that. Whatever it says, even if I can't figure it out, I'll just simply say, well, that's what it says. Now, one of these days, hopefully God will give us a little knowledge on that, all right? So, manner of interpretation. As with the totality of Scripture, we will seek to interpret the book of Revelation in a literal manner rather than figurative or allegorical. If you have been part of a Roman Catholic background, as some of you in here no doubt have been, uh, you understand that many uh, within the Catholic background will interpret the book of Revelation in a very allegorical, very uh, figurative manner, saying it's highly symbolic and things of that nature. But the problem is this, when the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. That is a very uh, trite statement that preachers have used down through the years, but it's still very appropriate. When the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. Because of this manner of interpretation, we will not be following what theology teaches us, but rather what the Bible teaches us. Now, what do you mean by that? A lot of times, people will grab a theology, a particular way of thinking, and then force that into the Bible and say, well, the Bible is teaching this theology. Well, how do you know that? Because my theology is forcing the verse to say this. Here's what we need to do if we're Bible believers. We allow the Bible to dictate our theology. We, our theology should be malleable. The Word of God should be consistent. This should form our opinion, not our theology forced on the text forming our opinion. So because of this manner of interpretation, we will not be following what theology teaches, but rather what the Bible teaches us. We will not let, excuse me, we will let the Bible speak freely. We will allow the text of Scripture to form our conclusions 
rather than forcing a conclusion onto the text. When there is doubt as to the exact meaning of the text, and trust me, there's a few passages in the book of Revelation that we can say, "Mm, not too certain about that. But when we get there, we will then make that clear to you, the hearer, and attempt to offer a sound and scriptural surmising that is basically me giving a good theological guess. But I will tell you that instead of saying, nope, that's exactly what the Bible says. Now, much of this study will be that's exactly what the Bible says. But some of it will be, hmm, I'm not too certain about that. Now, let me make a few of you mad, but let's just enjoy this anyway. Choice of translation. It is this preacher's humble and learned opinion that God has providentially preserved His Word through the pages of the King James Bible. If you choose to use another translation throughout this study, be advised that the doctrinal conclusions drawn will be from the King James Bible and not from a plethora of other newer translations. This is a free country. You can read whatever translation you want. Amen? But the fact of the matter is, Uh, I'm going to use a King James Bible during this study, and I will point out some obvious errors in the text from the other translations just to buttress my point. Over the course of this study, I will point out where the newer translations delete, add, and oftentimes misinterpret many scriptural passages by including a denominational bias. If I were you, And for the purposes of this study, I would have a King James Bible handy. I always tell people, if you don't believe my position, that's totally fine. It's a free country, but here's what I would do. I would have have a King James Bible and your other translation handy so you can make a compare and contrast. Amen? And then you can come to your own educated positions on that. I won't force my position on you. I'll just simply say I'm right and you're wrong. All right. (laughs) Now, with that said... I believe we've got some screen time for this. Where's Jerry? Is he downstairs? Is Arturo going to do this? Okay, all right. The first position that we want to explain tonight is the pre-tribulational, pre-millennial position. The pre-tribulational, pre-millennial position. There are three main positions when people approach the book of Revelation. I emphatically am approaching the book of Revelation and the totality of the Bible as a pre-tribulationist, a pre-millennialist. This is also referred to as a futurist position. This position maintains, now listen to me, this position maintains that Israel and the church are two distinct entities in the Bible. That God is not through with the nation of Israel and that the church, Christ's body, which is composed of both Jew and Gentile now, will be raptured and will not go through the time of Jacob's trouble, otherwise known as the seven-year Great Tribulation. This position maintains that the Bible should be interpreted literally that the book of Revelation was written later, between 90 A.D. to 95 A.D., give or take a year or two, and that much in the book of Revelation is yet to be fulfilled, hence futurist, a futurist position. The pre-tribulational, pre-millennial position has been the staple among fundamentalists and Baptist groups down through the centuries. It is rejected by the Roman Catholic Church and many Protestant groups as well, all the more reason to embrace it. I always tell people, whatever Rome's against, I'm technically for. And so when they come out and say, listen, this is the wrong position, Uh, this was somehow, uh, uh, came about through a guy named John Darby who was a Plymouth Brethren back in the mid-1850s, uh, that it, had no, uh, it had no history prior to that. I just simply say that is false, that is not true. Uh, Pastor Randy White, who pastors the First Baptist Church in, uh, in Taos, New Mexico, has a great book on this subject called uh, 
dispensationalism and pre-tribulationalism in history. And it talks about preachers and theologians who held to this position prior to 1850, and it goes all the way back. In fact, I would suggest that the Apostle Paul taught it. As far as I'm concerned, case is closed. So I am a pre-tribulational, pre-millennialist, and that is the way we're going to see the book of Revelation. The second position that is usually uh, accepted in this realm is the preterist position. The preterist position, also known as covenant theology. They don't really like to call themselves preterist anymore. They'll just say, well, we're covenantalists, which is a way of saying we don't believe a third of the Bible. Anyway, so this covenant theology holds that Israel finds its continuation and fulfillment in the church. In other words, the church has usurped and replaced Israel and all the promises that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are now recognized and fulfilled in the church. It is called replacement theology and that much, if not all, of the prophecies in the books of Daniel and the book of Revelation in particular have been fulfilled in the past. The preterist would say that Daniel's prophecies, specifically Daniel 7 through 12, the preterist would say that Daniel's prophecies were fulfilled from the 7th century B.C. until about the 1st century A.D., and that the prophecies in the book of Revelation were completed by about 70 A.D., no later, at the destruction of Jerusalem under Titus. I reject all of it. The preterist denies a pre-tribulational rapture and contends that the church will go through the time of Jacob's trouble and those who, quote, endure unto the end, Matthew 24, verse 13, will be raptured at the conclusion of this seven-year period. This position is embraced by Romanism, many Protestants, and even some Baptists. They all tend to be all millennial, meaning that there is no literal 1,000-year reign of Christ even though the word millennium or a thousand years shows up six times in one chapter in Revelation 20. But we shouldn't believe it just because it says it six times. So the preterist denies some very important things. The first thing that I think is a big no-no is this notion that the preterist would say that Israel has been not just set aside, but has been engulfed by the church and that not only has Israel been engulfed, but all the promises that God gave to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, will now be recognized within the church, which is why Romanism refers to the Vatican by a title that should only be used for Jerusalem, the Holy City. They refer to the Vatican as the holy city. That is a title that should only be designated for Jerusalem. Amen. It has nothing to do with a big mess over in Italy. You say, are you anti-Rome? I'm anti-Bible. Anti if you're one of those guys that would prescribe to this, I would just simply say, let's be careful. Let's talk a little bit about this. I would also suggest to you that the reason why the Roman Catholic Church down through the centuries was one of the major persecuting churches of Bible-believing Christians is because they took their P's and Q's from the Old Testament. Think about this. God told the Old Testament Israelites, when you go into the land, you go in there and slay them all. So the Romanists think, well, that's still my mandate, right? That's still my mandate. I'm standing up for truth. I'm standing up for what is right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'll add a caveat to what God told Joshua and what God told the other Israelites. I'll add this one caveat. Either convert to Rome or die. And that's what they did during the Inquisition. That was the only caveat they added to what God told Joshua, which is convert or die. In the Old Testament, by the way, there was no convert or die. 
They were just in the way, so they got killed, <laughs> okay? You say, well, I, I really have a problem with that. Take it up with God when you see him, okay? You can, you'll have a great conversation, I'm sure. But nevertheless, this group completely loathes Israel. Now, many of them will say they don't, and let me be fair, some of them may not. Some of them may not. But there is a very rabid contingency of these uh, covenant theologians that would have a rabid dislike for Jews and for Israel. And I am very cautious of people that call themselves covenant theology. Now, that doesn't mean that I automatically lump them with that group. But I will say that the inevitability of that doctrine leads one to conclude that if God's done with Israel, then let's just keep criticizing. Now, I still believe the Jew needs to get saved and recognize their Messiah. But at the same time, I don't think God's done with Israel. And that's why we still preach out of an Old Testament, and that's why we still believe it's the inspired Word of God. But we're not preterists here. And may I say also that much of a preterist position does not look at the book of Revelation as literally as they should. Many of them will look at it semi-literally, or they will spiritualize a text. So be very cautious about that. All right, first position is pre-tribulational, pre-millennial, as far as I'm concerned. That is the correct position. The second position is the preterist position. And the third position is called partial preterism or the partial preterist, also known as historical preterism. This position asserts that some of the prophecies in the books of Daniel and in the book of Revelation are yet to be fulfilled, but that most have already been fulfilled. And many of them would say that some of these prophecies were fulfilled between 13th century and 18th century Europe. It's a very weird position. Uh, they tend to be what is called post-millennial, which is something that's not as popular anymore, which means that Christians will make things, get, uh, will, will make things better on earth, thus paving the way for Jesus Christ to set up His earthly kingdom after the millennium. Now, I want you to think about something real quick. I want you to think about this. We've been in America for 230 years, okay? Obviously, I believe that America has some providential beginnings. And Christians have been here for at least 230 years of that. They, they started, they came over on the Mayflower. Many of them were Christians. How are we doing? How are we doing? We, we know the inevitable, the inevitable end here, which is the Laodicean church period. I mean, and, and we believe that we're in that now, and of course we'll get into that when we get into chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. But the early post-millennialists, the ones in the late 19th century and very early 20th century, had a notion that we can make the world better and thus usher in God's kingdom. Now they based this upon a faulty interpretation of some passages. I want you to take your Bibles and go to Matthew 13. And let's see, Bob knows this stuff. See, all right. All right, look at Matthew 13. And let's look at a few things here. And look at verse 33. Now let's start at verse 31. Matthew 13, starting in verse 31. Another parable, this is Jesus, of course, speaking, put he forth unto them, saying, quote, Jesus speaking, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater among herbs and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. All right. All right. Let's, let's get into the interpretation of some things real quick. Let's go into chapter 13, go down to verse 38. Uh, verse 37, he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. All right, so the good seed is the word. Can we all agree? The field that that good seed is being sown in is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. Okay, all right, so there's some interpretation. So let's go back to verse 31 and, and apply some things. 
The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed. So instead of just saying seed, he qualifies it by saying mustard seed, all right? Which a man took and sowed in his field. The field is the world. Which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is greatest among herbs. So essentially what the post-millennials will say is the seed is the gospel. And as it grows and expands, its bowels and its furrows reach out across the world and change it so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. And by the way, if Christianity is about the kingdom being expanded, then why are people lodging? Why are they resting? There is no rest for the weary. Come on. There is no rest. What are these birds doing on these boughs of this tree? Now you say, all right, well, why is that so important? Uh, go over to chapter 13 and, and look at verse number 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. Now instead of saying the, the fowls of the air, which is what uh, the Bible says up here in verse number, verse number 4, Notice in verse number four, it says, When he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Okay. Birds, in this context, do not have a good connotation. So when the interpretation of that first parable comes out in verse 18, he, instead of saying fowls in verse 19, says the wicked one. Okay. Now apply that interpretation to birds sitting on those boughs. Whatever is being planted and whatever grows is a haven for wicked things. But the post-millennialist interpret that, interpreted that passage to mean this is the gospel getting bigger and influencing the world, thus ushering in the kingdom. That is not the case, and of course, Verse number 33 is another verse that they looked at. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Let me ask you a question. Has leaven ever been anything positive in the Bible? Doesn't the Bible say a little leaven leavens the whole lump? In fact, when in the Old Testament, when God told them to prepare the Passover, make sure there was no leaven in the meal because it needed to be a type or a picture of the bread of life which would come down as the manna which was a picture of the bread of life Jesus Christ you want the interpretation for that go to John 6 Jesus lays it all out so I am not one of those guys that lights my candle or my my lighter and says I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony no, it's a great commercial back in the day, but the fact of the matter is the world is going to hell in a handbasket and your objective and my objective is to snatch a few with the gospel so that, that hell doesn't enlarge herself. So, we're not partial preterists around here. We don't believe that things are going to get better. We actually believe things are going to get worse. And if you believe your Bible, that's the way it's laid out. So, with that said, let's conclude. The whole study concludes tonight. Who is the book of Revelation about? Go back to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Now, why was all that stuff necessary? To show you how we're approaching this book. Not just the book of Revelation, but the whole of the Bible. Who is the book of Revelation about? Well, if you can read the first verse of the first chapter of Revelation, then the answer will be made very plain. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I can read the rest, but I think that about covers it, amen? The book of Revelation is about 
the revealing, the unveiling, the unmasking, whatever you want to, that's appropriate today, of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. As one continues to read chapter 1, this becomes ever more clear. Uh, look at verse number 11. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book. Send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Verse 12, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. We'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head, his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. And when I saw him, John said, I fell at his feet dead. And he said, uh, and, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And he has to amen himself and have the keys of hell and of death. And then he offers John some final parting notes in the next couple of verses. Here's my point. The whole book is about revealing Him. As one continues to read, it makes it more clear. If this means what it says and says what it means, this means that what follows in the book of Revelation is all intended to point us to Jesus Christ who is coming again for His church and is physically returning to this earth and will set foot on the Mount of Olives. Do not lose sight of this very basic truth, Christian, with all the drama, the macabre, and yes, the horror that ensues between Revelation 6 and Revelation 19, the main focus, even though there's drama, macabre, and horror, the main focus is to reveal or revelate Jesus Christ to the world in general and to Israel in particular. How do I know that? Look at verse 7 of the first chapter. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Now look at the general statement. And every eye shall see him. Now look at the particular statement. And they also which pierced him. So who's the every eye? That's the world in general. Who's the second group? They which pierced him? The Jews in particular. He's here. He's coming to show himself to the world, but he's coming in particular as Messiah to his people. And it is very clear that both of those truths are being communicated in the book of Revelation. So here's what I want to say to you. As you understand that both of those truths are being communicated, you now have to divide between the truth of Christ. Uh, showing himself to his people, the Jewish people, and Christ revealing himself to an unsaved world or those who might get saved under threat of death. You're going to have to make those divisions. I'm going to do my best to show you those divisions, but they're in there. And that is important because there's two groups he's showing himself to. The world in general, everybody, but then in particular to those who pierced him. You say, well, who are those people? Well, there's only one people that I can think of. Now listen. You say, preacher, when will this study get in earnest? Well, we'll actually get into the verses next week. But I think it's important that you understand, number one, the main three positions. We are not preterists. We do not believe that the church has replaced Israel. We believe that God has a plan for Israel, and if you have a doubt about that, read Romans 9, 10, and 11. We're also not partial preterists that we believe that the seed 
of the gospel is going to grow like a giant tree and a bunch of black birds are going to be sitting on it. And those birds are a type of things that we don't necessarily want sitting on our burrow, on our, on our boughs, and we want to be careful about that. And I'll have more to say about that over the course of the, of the coming weeks. But we are pre-tribulational and pre-millennial. And you say, why? Because that is how the whole of the Bible is laid out. I want to answer a question, then I'll close with this. Go ahead, Martha. A millennial? Preterist or ba Yes. Uh, all, preterist are, are all basically all millennial. Now, the partial preterist would say, and again, it depends on the preterist, the partial preterist you're talking to. Most partial predators would say, yeah, we believe in a thousand year reign. And then some of them would say, we don't. And say, then, then the rapture will come after that period of time or the 1,000 golden year. Here's the problem with the partial preterists, Martha. They're trying to bring in that thousand year reign through their own power, through, through, the, through the gospel influencing and the boughs of that tree extending out. Now, I want you to think about that. We're, we're, we're God's children. We're told to communicate the gospel. We're never told to make the world better. Now, by definition, when you're, you become a Christian, you would hope that you'd become better. But you still got your pot marks and your issues. There's no doubt about that. But listen, the way this is going to be... Now, let me tell you how God's going to make it better. Take your Bible, go to 2 Peter chapter 3. This is, how he, this is how he does it. Second <laughs> Peter chapter 3, verse number 10. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved... I don't care if we're a part of the Paris Accord or not. Right. It's all going to pot. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation, godliness? And by the way, that's a warning for the Christian to live right. To live right. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Amen. Now, here's the thing, folks. The Bible is laid out in such a way that you can't miss it. you got a guy in Genesis chapter 5 that just ends up disappearing. A guy by the name of Enoch, right? Now, you got to ask yourself this question as we kind of close this out tonight. Why was it so important for God to tell us in the first book of the Bible, not even six, seven chapters in, that there is a person who would be caught up who would never see death ever. Think about that. Why would God show you that so quickly in the book of, in the book of Genesis? That there would be a man who would be caught up alive who would never see death if not to show you in picture form in the future, a whole group of people who would be caught up alive, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Enoch is a picture of a group of people that will never see death who will be caught up because they walked with God. Now you say, all right, but there's a problem though. Uh, what, about, what about Noah? Noah? Uh, he, went through the, he went through the thing. Yeah, that's a picture of Israel. Right. It's a different ball game. You see, Enoch got called out before judgment. Exactly. But Noah and his eight went through judgment. That's, right. that's a picture of the nation of Israel yeah. getting... That is a picture of the nation of Israel. I just said that. The flood? Are we, are we okay? Yes. Come on, baby, let's do the swim. All right, all right. Sorry. I... 
Kind of like the monkey, kind of like the twist. All right, now listen. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm, I'm an old soul. But, but the fact of the matter is, Noah is a picture and his family is a picture of Israel going through. But coming out on the other end, you say, but what happened? Well, that's where the, that's where the type messes up, right? Because Noah messes things up on the other end. But we'll, when we get to that point, we'll, we'll figure out some things. All right, real quick, other than Martha, who else got a question? Because I answered Martha's question, I hope. Anybody else got a question before we leave tonight? It's 610. Yes, uh, Scott. We believe that the book of Revelation is yet future. It's just a technical, fancy way of saying we believe in the future. We're futurists. We believe it's yet future. That's it. Anybody else? Well, I hope you enjoyed at least this, uh, this little introduction. Uh, we will get into it in earnest next Sunday night. Uh, be disciplined disciples. Invite some other folks who might uh, benefit from this. Um, you're not going to get this. I'm, I'm just going to say it again. You're not going to get this anywhere else. You're going to get it right here at the way we're going to teach it. And there's going to be a few uh, monkey wrenches thrown in here and there that I think will be a blessing to you. So let's go ahead and pray. Father... Uh, we pray, Father, you bless tonight as we, as we go our separate ways. Father, I pray that what we've learned tonight, uh, by way of introduction, Lord, would at least set the, the tone uh, for how we're approaching the book of Revelation. Father, we pray that you will, uh, Lord, just reveal some wonderful truths to us, not just to this preacher, but as these folks study it on their own. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. we'll see you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, for those of you who can make it. Lord bless you.